What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another highly combustible reaction. We're jumping into something. The Restoration of Rome, Part 4, Charles V. I believe it's 4. V is 5, so the I before the V means 4, because there's only 3 in the Roman numerals. Yes, I believe it's 4, for Charles V. So let's jump in and let's check it out together if you guys enjoy the journey. Get over and show tomorrow's world viewpoint some love. This was coming at us from Mikhail, always keeping us on a history grind, and I appreciate it. What do you need? You want to you wanna join me for the history journey? Let's go on a trip. At a time when bloodlines determined kings and kingdoms could be acquired through marriage, it was predictable that someone would find a way to hack the system. Through generations of inbreeding and politically motivated marriages, the House of Habsburg cobbled together one of the largest, yet least unified empires the world has ever known. The power held by the Habsburgs would peak in the 1520s and 1530s under Charles V. It's helpful to begin several generations earlier, in 1356, when Charles IV issued a decree known as the Golden Bull of 1356, distancing Germany, more formally known as the Holy Roman Empire, from the influence of the papacy. The relationship between the European ruler and the papacy had been essential to previous empires led by Charlemagne and Otto, as explained in parts 2 and 3 of our Restoration of Rome series. This bull established how German kings would be chosen for the next 450 years. The King of the Romans was thereafter to be elected by the majority vote of seven electoral princes. By omitting any mention of the papacy, the document virtually nullified papal claims to intervene or confirm an election. More than 150 years later, in 1520, Charles V is crowned king in Aachen, Germany. Charles had begun his political career five years prior, assuming rule over the Netherlands as the Duke of Burgundy. A year later, following the death of his maternal grandfather, Ferdinand II, Charles was- Hey, we knew there was gonna be a dust connection somewhere. Here we go. A year later, following the death of his maternal grandfather, Ferdinand II, Charles was proclaimed King of Aragon and Castile, eventually controlling all of Spain and its territories in the New World. After the death of his paternal grandfather, Emperor Maximilian I, Charles was elected King of Germany. He now controlled an immense portion of Europe and beyond. However, there was little to unify this emerging empire. What common purpose could be held by conquistadors in the New World, princes in Germany, and noblemen in Spain or the Netherlands. At this time, Charles assumes the title of Roman Emperor, but was not yet crowned as such by the papacy. The rift established by the Golden Bull still existed. Charles recognized that religion stood as his best opportunity to create a cohesive empire. A fervent Roman Catholic, Charles hoped to unite all Europe in a Christian empire. However, a continent-wide crisis was fermenting which would cause both church and state to renew their historic interdependence. Only a month after Charles V moved to Spain, Martin Luther nails a document to yep. the door at the church at Wittenberg, Germany. This we did learn Europe about. was thrown into crisis. Fast forward just three years and Luther is excommunicated. Having added ruler of the German states to his impressive resume, Charles seeks to end the crisis by calling Luther to the Diet or assembly of worms. Charles promises Luther safe passage and an opportunity to defend his ideas. It was his hope that Luther would back down. After Luther refused to recant the substance of his writings and left the Diet, Charles drew up the Edict of Worms. With it, he rejected Luther's doctrines and essentially declared war on Protestantism. His efforts to fight Protestantism were not enough to keep Pope Clement on his side. More concerned with maintaining his own fragile rule over parts of Italy, Clement shifted his support between Charles and his primary rival, King Francis I of France, eventually siding with the French king in an attempt to slow the spread of the Habsburg rule. Uniting his empire under the banner of Christianity would prove difficult with the head of the Catholic Church supporting his enemy. In 1527, Spanish and German troops sacked Rome. The Pope, having surrendered to the mutinous troops, was ready for compromise. Having made peace with Charles, met him in Bologna. There he crowned him Emperor in February 1530. It was to be the last time that a Holy Roman Emperor was crowned by a Pope. I 
was going to say, does it like how I know that it was tradition for a Holy Roman emperor to be crowned by the Pope, but with him being the last, like how important was it after him that they were like, you know what, we're just going to separate ourselves completely. How does it work? Cause I understand that the Pope even still today has a lot of power. Religion has a lot of power in the world. They always have any kind of religion where you're the leader of that religion. Yes, there's going to be power involved. It has corrupted some popes now. For sure, we've heard those stories. But like, how important was it that the pope said, here you go, you're the king, or you're the emperor? Yeah. There he crowned him emperor in February 1530. It was to be the last time that a Holy Roman Emperor was crowned by a Pope. Charles was a guiding influence on the Counter-Reformation, which sought to rectify some of the issues in the Catholic Church which had led to the Reformation. While this would greatly alter the Church, his dream of reunification would not be achieved. Overextended, in debt, and facing external threats from both European rivals such as France and the rise of the Ottoman Turks under Suleiman the Magnificent, the Habsburg Empire had reached its zenith and began to wane. Charles would abdicate the throne, dividing his empire between his son and brother. Charles was not the first, nor would he be the last to attempt binding ill-fitting divisions of Europe into a type of revived Roman Empire. While religion had previously been seen as the ideal unifying agency, it too had become a divisive one. Any future government attempts to unite the continent will have to find a way to overcome the divisive force of religion. For Tomorrow's World Viewpoint, I'm Michael Haykoop. Hey, Michael, seriously, you have a fantastic voice for this. I needed your voice over today. This is absolutely intriguing to me, information that I knew a very general viewpoint of that we never really dove into details in in america in the schools it's really like hey this was your enemy we did good in the war and that's really all you hear like you don't really hear that much of this what we're hearing now and if you do you hear it in a way this damn show not anywhere interesting shout out to you seriously excellent excellent narrator voice Get over, show them some love on that channel, Tomorrow's World Viewpoint, for sure. If you would like to receive a free interactive report Bell, on this subject like from Tomorrow's World Analysis, you like it? visit tomorrowsworldviewpoint.org or click on the link in the description. Please. Subscribe and click the notification bell to receive updates about new content. Visit tomorrowsworld.org for more articles, telecasts, and booklets. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow's World Viewpoint with the restoration of rome part four charles the fifth shout out to michael for keeping us on the i love being able to go to bed every night having learned something having taken some sort of knowledge that i didn't know before and cramming it up here where all of these lyrics and shit sit smash the like button if you liked it the dislike button but i won't believe you check out the other video over here tell the next one highly combustible you guys be happy have they saved love you to the moon and back peace